Okay, let's start today's seminar. Oh, today's seminar speaker is Isabel Garcia Garcia from the KITP, and she will talk about P, not PQ. Please start. Okay, thank you so much for uh, the invitation and um, for coming to my to my talk today. So, as the title suggests, um, I'm going to be talking about parity solutions to the strong CP problem. So my talk is going to be largely based on this recent paper that I wrote with my collaborators at UCSB. I will start with a brief introduction about the strong CP problem and motivation for why to consider solutions to a strong CP that are different from the QCD axiom. I will then discuss in detail the structure of parity solutions. So these were first proposed by Kaladi Babu and uh, Ravindra Moapatra in this paper and also later on by, by Barr and, and collaborators. I want to emphasize that these are different from the so-called Nelson Barr models that uh, solve the strong CP problem by restoring CP. I will not be talking about those, uh, about those theories here. And then I will spend uh, most of my time discussing uh, the phenomenology of these models, including collider and flavor signatures, implications for EDM experiments, as well as gravitational waves. So there has been criticism of these parity solutions in the past, uh, in particular by these three authors, Alvay, Dine, and Draper. Uh, so I will try to bring up and address this, this criticism as we go along. Okay, so let me start with a brief review of what the strong CP problem is and apologies to those of you who already know this very well. So as you engage theories in general have a discrete set of classical minima that are degenerate. These minima correspond to field configurations that are pure gauge. So they are all degenerate with um, zero energy, but nevertheless, they have a non-trivial topology. And in particular, it is possible to classify them in topologically distinct classes. And this classification can be done in terms of a single integer, uh, which we call winding number. So classically, you could choose any one of these vacua with a given winding number and just expand around, around that vacuum. However, quantum mechanically, there is tunneling between topologically distinct sectors. And as usual, in a semi-classical expansion, this tunneling is described by the existence of instantons. So appropriately normalize uh, the action of young mill instantons is given by an integer, which is the topological charge of the instanton. So instantons with topological charge, say Q, describe tunneling between vacua whose winding numbers uh, differ by, by Q units, okay? So the vacuum of the theory is not a vacuum with a given winding number. Instead, it must include a linear combination of, of all of those vacua. In defining this linear combination, there is a phase ambiguity that is captured by a single angular parameter that we call theta. Uh, and in principle, it could take any value from, from zero to two pi. And for obvious reasons, um, this parameter typically goes by the name of the Jan Mills vacuum angle. So the value of theta enters the theory as a boundary condition that we need to impose in order to properly characterize, characterize our vacuum. Physical quantities will then depend on theta. In particular, uh, the vacuum energy density is now, is now theta dependent. And of course, uh, as you all have seen in the Lagrangian formulation of an SUN gauge theory, this angle appears as the coefficient of this topological operator which also makes it obvious that any value of theta that is neither zero nor pi will violate both parity uh, and also CP. In more general uh, non-abelian theories that contain charged matter, the physical significance of this vacuum angle crucially depends on the spectrum of charged fermions. In the standard model in particular, there is a single vacuum angle that is physical, uh, which is the vacuum angle of, of QCD. And for historical reasons, uh, it typically goes by the name of, of theta bar. And as I said earlier, theta bar provides a physical measurement of both parity and CP violation in the strong sector of the standard model. 
So the most useful quantity in terms of probing the value of the QCD vacuum angle experimentally is the electric dipole moment of the neutron. So the theoretical prediction for the neutron EDM is proportional to theta bar, and it is given by, by this expression in the appropriate units. So experimentally, we have not observed a neutron EDM. All we have currently is, is this upper bound, which in turn constrains the value of theta bar to be smaller than around 10 to the minus 10, okay? So the QCD vacuum angle needs to be incredibly, incredibly small. And this is a problem um, or a puzzle for, for the following reasons. So in the standard model, the QCD vacuum angle receives contributions from two different sources. On the one hand, from the coefficient of the topological operator involving the QCD field strengths. And on the other hand, from the argument of the determinant of the quark mass matrix. Now, we know in particular that the quark mass matrix has to be complex. And we know that because that is a requirement for there to be CP violation in the electroweak sector of the standard model. And we've known for a long time that indeed uh, the phase uh, in, the, in the CKA matrix is not only non-zero, but actually uh, order one. And in fact, it is both uh, CP and also parity uh, that are both maximally violated by the, by the electroweak interaction. So this brings us to the essence of the strong CP problem, which is that it is not possible to understand the smallness of the QCD vacuum angle based only on the underlying symmetries of the standard model. Instead, if we want to explain why theta bar is so small, we need either a dynamical mechanism or some additional symmetry structure beyond what we have in the standard model. So traditionally, the most popular mechanism to solve the strong CP problem has been the so-called QCD axiom. In this context, theta bar is not just a parameter. Instead, it gets promoted to the status of a dynamical field, the axiom, which is a pseudonambu Goldstone boson of a spontaneously broken uh, U1 global symmetry that we call uh, U1PQ for, for Peter Quinn. And that crucially must also be broken explicitly by, by QCD. So being a pseudoscalar, the axion can couple to the QCD field strength in this way. In turn, uh, QCD dynamics generate a potential for the axion that is periodic and has a minimum for a value of the axiom vacuum expectation value such that the effective QCD vacuum angle completely vanishes, therefore solving the strong CP problem. So on the face of it, this is a very minimal and elegant solution to the strong CP problem and um, a huge amount of, of experimental effort has gone into, into probing the, the axiom paradigm. However, it has one important flaw, which is that in order to really work, uh, this mechanism must be such that the breaking of the U1PQ symmetry by QCD and therefore the generated action potential must dominate to one part in 10 to the 10 over any other contribution uh, that may come from additional degrees of freedom. So new dynamics responsible for say, solving the hierarchy problem or doing biogenesis or dark matter they cannot contribute significantly to the, to the axiom potential. And this is especially problematic since, as you all have heard, we expect that all global symmetries will be violated in any gravitational UV completion. So the violation of the U1PQ symmetry by gravity will generate a potential for the axiom that in turn will move the theory away from the vacuum of, of vanishing theta bar. So, for example, if we consider the leading higher dimensional operator that violates uh, the U1PQ symmetry, so phi here is the Petya Queen field, the face of which again is the axion, then in order not to spoil the solution to the strong CP problem, the coefficient of this dimension five operator, for example, would need to be incredibly, incredibly small. So we say that uh, the PQ symmetry needs to be a very high quality global symmetry, which is somewhat in tension with the breaking of global symmetries that we expect in the context, in the context of quantum gravity. And this tension uh, goes by the name of the action quality problem. 
So it is not impossible to solve the action quality problem and arrange for the U1 PQ symmetry to be an accidental, very high quality global symmetry, but these efforts certainly come at the expense of, of minimality, which is often advertised as one of the most attractive features of, of the QCD axiom. More to the point, um, arranging for uh, the U1 PQ symmetry to remain a very approximate uh, global symmetry in the context of a gravitational UV completion, such as a string theory. While it is possible, it puts important constraints on a string theory model building that lead to the soft prediction that, in fact, there should be many other particles with the qualitative properties of, of the QCD axion. So, this leads to the picture of the so-called string axivers. So obviously at this point, uh, we have discovered neither the QCD axion nor any of these axivers actions. So all of these considerations together, uh, to my mind, motivate taking seriously alternative solutions to, to the strong CP problem. So an alternative class of solutions to the strong CP problem are those based on restoring space-time symmetry. So since a non-zero value of theta bar violates both parity and CP, restoring either of these symmetries can provide a solution to the, to the strong CP problem. So even though, uh, again, theta bar measures the amount of P and CP violation in the, in the QCD sector, the origin of the strong CP problem, as we just discussed, uh, really lies in the features of the electroweak sector. So the fact that it is the electroweak interactions that maximally violate uh, these two symmetries. So this class of solutions focus on extending the electroweak sector of the standard model in a way such that either parity or CP are now good symmetries of the, of the extended theory. There's another good reason uh, to my mind to consider this class of solutions, which is that in the context of a full UV completion, such as a string theory, discrete space-time symmetries can arise as gauge symmetries after a spontaneous symmetry breaking in, in higher dimensions. And in that case, being gauge symmetries, they can only be broken spontaneously, not explicitly. And depending on the scale of a spontaneous symmetry breaking, uh, they could indeed solve the strong CP problem in a way that is more an accident uh, of the features of the UV completion as opposed to being the result of a model building effort that is especially designed to, to arrange for, for a small theta bar. So let me tell you about solutions to a strong CP that are based on restoring parity. And as I said earlier, these were first proposed by, by these various authors. Um, so to restore parity symmetry and solve the strong CP problem, the gauge group of the standard model needs to be extended to include an additional SU2 factor, this SU2 right. And similarly, uh, the matter content needs to be extended to include effectively a mirror copy of both the Higgs and the fermion sectors of the, of the standard model. The only difference is that um, as you to left doublets uh, of the standard model, in the mirror sector, they become doublets of, of as you to write. So um, with this extended structure, it is possible to define a generalized version of parity that acts just like ordinary parity, but also exchanges the fields of the standard model and, and mirror sector. So the SU2 left gauge sector is exchanged with SU2 right and, and similarly for the Higgs and the, and the fermions. So in the model that I'm showing you here, the SU3 and U1 factors are not mirrored. Uh, they are not duplicated. Therefore, they will just transform as usual under, under parity. So not mirroring the SU3 factor is crucial. Um, this ensures that theta bar remains old under this generalized version of parity, uh, which is crucial to solve the strong CP problem. And in fact, um, because the QCD vacuum angle remains old under this generalized parity, I am just going to call it parity in, in going forward. 
Duplicating the U1 factor uh, in principle is optional. In principle, it doesn't affect how the model solves the strong CP problem, but as we will see uh, in a couple of slides, there are some good reasons why, why you'd rather not, not have two U1 factors. Okay, so with this extended gauge sector and matter content, uh, parity can now be a good symmetry of the theory. This requires, uh, first of all, that the coefficient of the GG dual operator uh, vanishes, so theta s has to be zero. And also that the Yukawa couplings in the standard model and mirror sectors are the same. So for example, uh, in the Abhor sector, we'll have Yukawa interactions for both the standard model and mirror fields. That the entire Yukawa sector respects parity requires that these two couplings are equal to each other, okay? So because of the extended quark content of these models, when we compute the contribution to theta bar from the quark sector, there is now an extra term that comes from, from the mirror quarks and it has this form. So provided the parity is a good symmetry, so provided the, the two Yukawa couplings in the two sectors are equal, this new term exactly cancels the piece coming from, from the standard model. So in total, um, at three level, parity enforces that theta bar completely vanishes in these models. Um, and later on, I'll talk about, uh, of course, what happens uh, with radiative corrections when parity, once parity is broken. So obviously parity needs to be broken in these models to make sure that all the mirror particles are heavy enough to have escaped experimental detection. So let me first discuss uh, the breaking of parities through just a soft term in the scalar potential, okay? So first of all, uh, generalized parity allows us to write various terms in the Higgs potential. So a mass square piece, as well as two different types of, of quartic couplings. And for now, again, uh, let me just break parity softly by including a mass square term like this. So involving only one, only one of the Higgs doublets. So arranging for different vacuum expectation values for the Higgs of the, of the standard model and, and mirror sectors requires a fine tuning already at three level between, between disparity preserving and disparity breaking masses. And parametrically uh, that fine tuning is just given by the ratio of the, of the two BEVs squared. So this is an irreducible amount of fine tuning in these models. Um, if we ask that it is better than one part in, in 10 to the 10, since at the end of the day, uh, we're trying to solve the strong CP problem, uh, that sets an upper bound on the, the parity breaking scale of order 10 to the seven, 10 to the eight GP. Obviously, this is a very low bar, um, and we will see uh, in a minute that, in fact, we can do we can do a lot better than this. And now, this is probably already um, apparent to some of you, but the structure of this scalar potential and of the entire theory more generally is the same as what we find in theories that try to address the electroweak hierarchy problem by realizing the Higgs as a pseudonambu Goldstone boson of some accidental uh, global symmetry. And the most famous example of this uh, are the so-called twin Higgs, twin Higgs models. So let me make a, a very brief parenthetical remark to remind you about to remind you about this. So the main idea behind uh, the twin Higgs mechanism is to realize the Higgs of the standard model uh, at the pseudonambu Goldstone of an approximate SG4 global symmetry. So the necessary ingredients uh, of this idea are, uh, first of all, a, a so-called twin sector that is a copy of the standard model, uh, both in terms of field content and, and also gauge interaction. So the most minimal implementation of this idea that is discussed in the this, in this second paper, in fact, only requires uh, duplicating the SG2 factor, uh, which is exactly the same we have in the, in the parity symmetric models that we, are, that we are discussing here. And also uh, a global C2 symmetry that exchanges the fields of the, of the standard model and mirror sectors. And as a consequence of that uh, C2 symmetry, it imposes that 
all the couplings in the two sectors are equal. This is obviously also present in the, in the parity symmetric models that we are discussing. Um, it precisely corresponds to the internal part of our generalized parity symmetry. So as an accidental consequence of this uh, C2 symmetry, the mass square in the Higgs potential satisfies an accidental SU4 symmetry. This SU4 symmetry is broken down to SU3 when the Higgs uh, get their BEP. So this leads to seven goldstones. Three of them become, as usual, the longitudinal modes of the SU2 left gauge bosons. Three become the longitudinal modes of, of the SU2 right uh, guides. And the leftover one uh, we identify with the, with the Higgs we've discovered. And crucially, um, because of the, of the global C2 symmetry, radiative corrections to the mass square in the, in the scalar potential will remain SG4 symmetric, and therefore they do not affect the mass of the, of the pseudonumber goldstone of the Higgs. So the web of uh, the mirror Higgs, uh, that remains quadratically sensitive to physics in the UV, and the theory does need to be uh, UV completed at some scale that is at most a factor of four pi above, above V prime, above the, the, um, the web in the, in the mirror sector. So solving the full hierarchy problem still requires explaining why, why this scale V prime is much smaller than the Planck scale. But the weak scale, so the Higgs of the BEV in the standard model, that is already stabilized by the, by the twin Higgs mechanism. So a hierarchy between V and V prime still requires fine tuning. And this is what I was calling earlier on the irreducible amount of fine tuning in these models. But with respect to the Planck scale, there is only one scale that we need to stabilize, not two, okay? So what I really want to emphasize is that um, this class of parity solutions to the strong CP problem do not introduce a second big hierarchy problem, okay? And this is because of this accidental uh, twin Higgs structure. And a criticism actually that was made by these authors is that naively these models uh, seem to require the stabilization of additional scales beyond, beyond the weak scale, uh, but this is in fact not true. There is a single uh, large hierarchy problem in this series, uh, just like there is in, in any extension of the standard model. Okay. So obviously uh, the first question that we want to answer is how low the parity breaking scale can be so as to make that irreducible amount of fine tuning uh, in this model as small as possible. So we said earlier that parity enforces um, the Yukawa couplings and the, and the gauge couplings in the two sectors to be identical. So naively this predicts that the spectrum of new particles is just a copy of, of the standard model, but just heavier by, by a factor of V prime over V, okay? And in this case, uh, the lightest mirror particles could be the partners of the, of the up and down quarks. So current LHC bounds already imply tight limits on the mass of uh, new color particles on the order of, of a TV or so, which in turn would set a lower bound on the parity breaking scale of order 10 to the 8 GB. And this could put the fine tuning uh, in, the, in the scalar sector of these models to be worse than one part in, in 10 to the 10. And I should say that the phenomenology of this particular implementation of these models was looked at by um, Raffaele Daniolo and, and Anson Hook in this, in this paper. So it seems like the amount of fine tuning in these models is even worse than the small number that we're trying to explain here. So you're probably wondering whether this is the end of my talk. Um, this is not the end of my talk because there is an additional source of fermion masses that we can write in this theory, which are vector-like masses that involve the SU to left and SU to right singlets of the standard model and, and the mirror sectors, okay? And a new term like this uh, can be consistent with generalized parity provided that this three times three uh, vector-like mass matrix is, is Hermitian, okay? 
Okay, so with this extra term, uh, the full quark mass matrix, we can write it as a six times six matrix like this. Um, and the contribution uh, to theta bar from, from the quark sector, uh, we can now write it as, as the determinant of the full mass matrix uh, in the both in the up and down and down quark sectors. So because of this zero in the upper block of the full mass matrix, so it is not possible with the matter content of this theory to write a relevant operator with the appropriate um, quantum numbers to fill this block. So because of this, uh, the expression for theta q, in fact, does not involve this, this vector-like mass, okay? It is the same as it was before, and therefore it remains zero at three level, provided that the Yukawa couplings, again, uh, satisfy generalized parity. Notice this would also be true, even if, even if this vector-like mass matrix was not Hermitian. So even if parity was broken softly by non-Hermitian vector-like muscles, we would still have theta bar uh, vanishing at three level in this in these models. And I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk a bit more about this, about this later. Crucially, um, these, these vector-like masses are only possible in the version of these models that include a single uh, U1 factor. If there were two U1 factors, one for the, from the standard model, one for the mirror fields, then obviously this type of operator um, will be forbidden by, by gauge invariance. So including this additional mass term, there are now two limiting realizations of the fermion spectrum in these models. One is the case that we already discussed. So if the overall scale of the vector-like masses, what I'm calling capital M here, if that is much smaller than both B and V prime, then bounds on color particles imply a tight bound of V prime and therefore an unacceptable level of, of fine tuning as we just discussed. An alternative possibility is to take the scale of the vector like masses to be much larger than both V and V prime. So this leads to an effective CISO mechanism that can be realized for all the light fermions of the standard model. So all the quarks and leptons uh, with the exception of, of the top, obviously. So in this case, uh, the mirror partners of all the light standard, standard model fermions appear at the scale of the, of the vector-like masses. So what I'm going to call the CISO scale. So now uh, new color particles can be made heavy by increasing the CISO scale, not the parity breaking scale. And this is going to help a lot uh, with fine tuning as we'll, as we'll discuss in a minute. And this is precisely the, the implementation of these models that we focus on in this, in this paper. I should emphasize that the CISO scale doesn't have to be the same for all fermions in principle it can be different for the different flavors, uh, so long as it is parametrically above, above V prime, above the parity breaking scale. But yes, for simplicity, I am going to assume that it is um, some common scale um, capital M, okay? The details, the details of these are not um, particularly important. There is an upper bound on how large this CISO scale can be that comes from the requirement that we reproduce the mass of, of the light standard model fermions in a way that is consistent with the fundamental Yukawa couplings remaining perturbative. So the tightest bound, uh, the strongest bound comes from the bottom quark and it constrains the CISO scale to be no more than around a factor of 100 or so above, above the parity breaking scale. So because of uh, the CISO implementation of the masses of the light fermions, so uh, the right components of, of the standard model fermions are made of as you to write doublets, uh, whereas the much uh, heavier fermions, the ones that appear at the CISO scale, those are mostly SU2 singlets. So the easiest way to see this is by integrating out at three level, the mirror fermions at the CISO scale. This leads to a dimension five higher dimensional operator of this form. And 
when the Higgs of the standard model and mirror sectors get their vacuum expectation values, this leads to a mass for, for the light fermions, okay? So crucially, uh, the right-handed component of this Dirac fermion belongs in an SU2 right multiplet. And this will be true for, for the down core sector, but also for leptons, as well as for, for the first and second generation of upworks. The one exception, of course, is uh, the top sector. So the top core is too heavy to implement uh, the CISO mechanism. And in this case, both the top and, and its mirror partner are made entirely of, of a standard model and, and mirror sector fields. So as Excuse a concept, yes. Uh, may I ask a question? Of course. Before going to the, the, uh, the slider, uh, yeah. you go back to the previous slide. So this capital M is essentially, mm -hmm. well, in principle, it's a three by three matrix and a basis of flavor. Yes. And are you, are you just assuming it's diagonal or? It, it doesn't have to be diagonal. Uh, for the purposes mm -hmm. of this talk and also in our paper, we assume that there isn't a, a hierarchy of, of scales among, among the, the three different eigenvalues. So they are all roughly at the same scale. Uh, mm -hmm. If they are different by an order one amount, um, mm -hmm. that's fine. It doesn't change anything. So that's why I'm sort of parameterizing it by like some overall, some overall scale. Okay. And then, and also there's a um, sort of my runner phases in it, and it could be uh, affecting to the Yuka couplings, I guess. Uh, just like uh, normal leptonic CSO models. Yeah, so as far as the phases in the Yukawa matrices is concerned, uh, mm -hmm. that can be completely general. Uh, and in general, mm -hmm. you know, these models, so let me go back perhaps very briefly um, to this slide. Um, so the only thing that, um, you know, this type of generalized parity demands is that the Yukawa couplings in the two sector are equal to each other. This enforces this constellation in the contribution to theta bar, but it completely allows for general phases in the, in the Yukawa coupling. So the CKM phase in gen will be order one. So this is consistent with having a CKM phase that is order one. Um, it's just the relation between the Yukawa couplings in the two sector that cancels uh, in the contribution to theta bar. Yeah, but I'm not talking about the CKM, but uh, uh, rather, you know, in the CKM, it's a direct phase, but uh, uh, I'm yes. talking about Majorana phase coming out of the, uh, the Majorana uh, vector-like mass. So and, you mean uh, in the neutrino sector specifically? <clears throat> you know, in a neutrino case, um, in addition to direct phase, we have we got two Majorana phases that coming out of the mm -hmm. uh, Majorana mass. And uh, I'm imagining the same thing in this case. Yes. So, so indeed, um, we do, I do not discuss, I will not discuss it in this talk. And we also mm -hmm. don't talk about it at all in the paper. Uh, mm -hmm. The neutrino sector, you could implement the same CISO mechanism for the neutrinos or not. And that works mm -hmm. very much like in any CISO model of neutrino masses. In, so in that sense, mm -hmm. there is nothing different. Um, and then in a quark sector, is there any additional CP phase you expect uh, arising from this um, vector-like mass? There are deviations from from the the structure of the standard model. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there are I mean a number of things. So, for example, you know, the, if you compute the CKA matrix, for example, that won't be exactly unitary. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are deviations, uh, but these are very small. So they are, they are typically uh, on the order of, you know, V prime over M square. So these are things which are mm -hmm. even smaller than a one in, in 10 to the three correction to, to the standard model parameters. So mm -hmm. yes, um, but the CISO scale is so large that, mm -hmm. you know, in practice th those, you know, that, you know, that would be sort of like a, those precision measurements are not really putting any constraints on, on these models. There are other observables that are better um, to, to constrain this, this class of theories in this limit. I see. And, and also those phases that do not affect the, the, the strong CP that's you. No. 
No, precisely because no matter what you're doing, like it has to be mm -hmm. parity symmetric so that, you know, that makes okay. sure that, you know, the cancellation mm -hmm. takes place. I see, I see. All right, thank you. No worries, thanks. Okay, so- I also had one question, maybe I just missed it. Um, did, do you gauge the SU2R? Or is yes. it left as a global symmetry? No, no, okay. it's gauged. Yeah, so yeah. C2R is gauged, and the mirror U1Y is uh, left global. Yes. I see. Thank you. Indeed. Um, okay, so uh, precisely as a consequence of uh, this CISO mechanism, the right handed component of the standard model fermions now have unsuppressed couplings to, to the gauge bosons of the SU2 right sector. So. They couple to these just like their left-handed currents uh, coupled to the to the standard model W and C. So as a result of this, the living constraint on the parity breaking scale in these models actually comes from the direct production of, of W prime and C prime gauge bosons uh, at the LHC. And in particular, the current bound on, on the W prime mass, uh, this is a order of around 60 V, which translate into a parity breaking scale that needs to be at least 18 TV, okay? So this brings the fine tuning in these models to around one part in 10 to the three. So not fully natural, but uh, certainly a lot better than, than one part in, in 10 to the 10. And uh, future colliders such as, for example, uh, the FCC, so 100 TV proton machine, uh, they will, this will be sensitive to masses, to W prime masses, up to around uh, 40, 40 TV or so, which corresponds to around uh, one part in, in 10 to the five fine tuning. So effectively, uh, this will be probing most of the parameter space where these models remain attractive solutions to the, to the strong CP problem. I want to emphasize that this is an irreducible signature of this model. So in this sense, collider experiments are central to probe this class of solutions to the, to the strong CP problem. Bounds coming from all other particles are substantially weaker. So another irreducible feature of these models is the presence of a top partner at the scale V prime at the parity breaking scale. But current bounds on, on additional color particles are a lot weaker, and they are certainly not competitive with, with the bound of V prime that we find from, from W prime and, and C primes. Similarly, these models also have a second Higgs at some scale below the priority breaking scale, depending on the value of, of this quartic coupling. Um, Bounds on a mirror Higgs uh, like this are also very weak and they will only lead to, to a competitive bound on, uh, on V prime for some, some small value of this, of this quartic coupling. And finally, uh, because of the CISO implementation of all the light standard model fermions, all other mirror quarks and leptons only appear at, at a much higher scale, uh, which is the CISO scale which has to be parametrically above, above V prime. So also very hard to, to ever produce uh, directly. Let me now turn to flavor briefly. So these models have new sources of flavor changing neutral currents already at three level and mediated by, by the standard model Z and, and Higgs boson. So, for instance, if we integrate out the C, there will be new contributions to the effective Hamiltonian describing, for example, the decay of a strange B meson into two muons. Notice this Wilson coefficient is proportional to G Fermi and this coefficient here, this corresponds to the strength of this flavor violating vertex. So, if this coefficient was order one, then these models uh, would certainly be very ruled out. However, in these models, the size of these, of these coefficients is naturally uh, extremely suppressed. So the exact expression for, for this coefficient is, is given by an expression like this. So it involves the various entries in the Yukawa couplings as well as the mass of the, of the vector-like fermion. So, 
Crucially, there is an upper bound on the size of this coefficient from the requirement that the masses of the standard model fermions are correctly reproduced through the, through the season mechanism. So parametrically, this upper bound uh, looks something like this. So it is proportional to the masses of those fermions that are involved in the, in the flavor violating interaction suppressed by the parity breaking scale, which as we just said, has to be at least 18 TeV. And there is an additional suppression factor involving the ratio of the weak scale to the, to the CISO scale. So the size of this Wilson coefficient is naturally very, very tiny in these, in these models. So for instance, uh, the fractional difference in the branching ratio for this decay compared to the, to the prediction in the standard model is at most of one part in 10 to the three. And that is a lot smaller than even the theoretical uncertainty in the, in the standard model prediction, which is of order uh, 10%. So there is a sort of built-in suppression of, of three-level flavor changing neutral currents in these models that uh, to some extent is a, a collateral consequence of implementing this, this CISO mechanism. At one loop, things are a little different. So the presence of a mirror W and mirror up quarks leads to additional contributions to the usual standard model box diagrams that contributes to, for example, chaos mixing. Um, quantitatively, the leading effect actually comes from diagrams that involve one W and one and one W prime. So the leading contribution to delta mk, so this is the mass difference between the two mass eigenstates in the k sector. And the leading contribution actually comes from diagrams where, where the up and charm quarks uh, propagate inside this loop. And it is roughly uh, of this size, which is also substantially smaller than, than the theoretical uncertainty in the, in the standard model prediction for this, for this quantity. The correction to the epsilon k parameter, which measures uh, CP violation in the in the kaon sector, is basically uh, given by the imaginary part of this of this diagram. So, the correction to epsilon k uh, can be large, but it depends on the individual entries uh, of the Yukawa matrices in a way that is not constrained by reproducing the the light fermion masses. So. If we don't assume any particular structure in the off diagonal entries of the Yukawa couplings, the measurement of epsilon k uh, can be interpreted as a lower bound on, on the CISO scale in the up sector, in this case, of order between 750 and, and 1000 TeV, which is compatible with the upper bound uh, we found earlier from the requirement that the, the Yukawa couplings um, stay perturbative. So overall, uh, these theories are certainly consistent with current flavor measurements, um, but a more in detail analysis could, could certainly reveal some constraints on, on the flavor structure of these models uh, of this form. And, for example, uh, related to the question that uh, was asked earlier, um, the details of this story in particular in the flavor sector uh, will certainly change if instead of an overall scale for, for the eigenvalues of those vector-like masses, if there was some kind of hierarchy between, between, those, between those eigenvalues, then the flavor story potentially would be, would be a little different. Okay, so uh, let's now move on to discuss what happens to theta bar beyond three levels. So once parity, once parity is broken, and let me focus first again on what happens when parity is broken softly. So if parity is only broken softly through a mass term in the scalar potential, that amounts to breaking P without, uh, without breaking CP and in this case, uh, the correction to theta bar uh, will be no larger than, than in the standard model. In this case, there are no new phases and moreover, um, there, are some, there are some additional cancellation because parity is restored uh, above, the scale, above the scale B prime. 
there is a second source of soft breaking, which is again through through vector-like masses that are non-hermitian, and this breaks both parity and also CP. So at three level, as I already discussed earlier, um, because of the structure of the of the quark mass matrix, theta bar remains zero, regardless of whether the vector-like mass is hermitian or not. So it remains zero as long as the Yukawa couplings are equal. So zero uh, if the breaking if the breaking is soft. At one loop, uh, there are corrections to the quark mass matrix that in general are, are complex. So the relevant diagrams are, are these. They involve the Higgses uh, and the C and C primes, as well as the heavy mirror fermions uh, propagating in the loop. So the contribution to the quark mass matrix from these diagrams in general is complex, uh, but when you trace over all of the flavors to find out the contribution to theta bar, in fact, the answer is zero. So theta bar stays zero also, also at true level. And in fact, this calculation was first done in this, in this original paper. However, there is another set of one loop diagrams, which are the same diagrams, but with a photon line coming out of these, of these, uh, of the internal fermion. Okay. And this leads to a contribution to the electric dipole moments of elementary fermions, both quarks and leptons, that in general um, are non-zero. So parametrically, these EDMs are, they have this form. So they are proportional to the charge and mass of the, of the fermion in question. And they are suppressed by two powers of the, of the C2 scale, okay? The mass of the, of the heavy fermion. And Obviously, they are also proportional to the source of soft breaking. So this factor of delta M on M is my way of parameterizing how much the, the vector-like masses deviate from, from hermeticity. So let's put in some numbers. Uh, if the deviation from hermeticity is, is order one, then the size of the electric dipole moments for the up and down quarks uh, would be parametrically of this size, so 10 to the minus 28 uh, e times centimeter. And I am normalizing this to, to a CISO scale, which roughly is twice uh, the value of the, of the lower bound on the parity breaking scale. So this will translate into a neutron EDM that is parametrically of the same size. That is two, two orders of magnitude below uh, the current bound on the neutron EDM, but it could be within, within reach of near future, near future experimental improvements. Although, of course, uh, this depends strongly on the size of this of these vector-like mass. Similarly, in the lepton sector, so parametrically, the size uh, of the electron EDM in this, in this series is of this form. And here I am already choosing a value of the of the CISO scale in the lepton sector that saturates the, the experimental bound on the electron EDM. So the exact value of these electric dipole moments uh, certainly depends on, on the details of the model. In particular, it depends on the size of the CISO scale in the various fermion sectors. But in general, uh, the predicted both neutron and electron EDMs could certainly be within reach of future experimental improvements. More realistically, uh, in a full theory, we might expect that the breaking of parity happens spontaneously, not just explicitly. And again, in principle, this could happen with or without breaking CP. So, for example, we can break parity without breaking CP uh, in a sector with, with two real scalar fields, what I'm calling here sigma and sigma prime. If this particular quartic coupling is negative, then the vacuum of this theory happens when, when one of the fields gets above and, and the other one is zero. Then coupling the sigma sector to the Higgs sector, uh, this can translate the spontaneous parity breaking to the, to the Higgs sector, and it would allow us to, to realize different BEVs for the, for the standard model and, and mirror Higgses. 
So I'm not suggesting that this is the most uh, beautiful implementation of spontaneous parity breaking in these models. I just wanted to emphasize that it is at least in principle possible to break parity without breaking CP. And in that case, the value of theta bar will again uh, remain at least as small as, as it is in the standard model. Of course, more generally, we might suspect that breaking parity will also involve breaking CP. Uh, this will be the case, certainly, if, if parity is broken through the web of a pseudo-scalar, uh, which can then be translated into the Higgs sector through, through the appropriate couplings. However, in this case, uh, it is also possible to write down a new class of Yukawa couplings involving uh, the pseudoscalar and the, and the SG2 singlet fermions. And again, uh, this is consistent with generalized parity so long as these, these new Yukawa couplings are themselves Hermitian. So with these new couplings, there are now a new class of one loop diagrams that contribute to the quark mass matrix. So these are the same type of diagrams we had before, except that now the Higgses can mix with this with the pseudo scalar. So this leads to a contribution to theta bar at one loop that is of this form. Okay. And in order for this to be smaller than 10 to the minus 10, these, these new Yukawa couplings would have to be very tiny, uh, smaller than, than 10 to the minus six or so. And this was actually first pointed out by these guys in this, in this paper. So if the breaking of parity also involves breaking CP in the scalar sector, as in, as in this example, then the symmetry breaking sector cannot really interact with, with the quarks with any, with any appreciable strength. This is not the most attractive feature uh, of these models, but at least having these Yukawa couplings being very tiny is actually, um, is actually technically natural. So they won't be radiatively generated if they are not there um, at tree level. Okay. Now, one of the motivations uh, to consider solutions to a strong CP that are different from uh, the QCD action was that the U1 PQ symmetry has to remain a very high quality global symmetry, and that has to be true in any UV completion. By contrast, uh, as I'm going to discuss now, parity can easily be broken without spoiling the solution to the, to the strong CP problem. So, if parity is a global symmetry, the leading higher dimensional operator that breaks parity uh, explicitly and, and leads to a direct contribution to theta bar um, looks like this. So these operators are dimension five. They are suppressed by a single power of M Planck. So if these coefficients that um, I am calling uh, alpha here, so these, this matrix is alpha, if these are non-Hermitian, then these operators will explicitly break generalized parity. If this is the case, uh, then when the, um, the Higgses in both the standard model and mirror sectors get their vacuum expectation values, then these operators lead to a contribution to the quark mass matrix that in general will be complex and therefore uh, will typically contribute to, to theta bar. In particular, uh, the leading contribution to, to theta bar uh, quantitatively comes from, from the correction to the masses of the, of the up and down quarks. So overall, uh, the contribution to theta bar is of this form where mod alpha here refers to the typical size of the coefficients of these higher dimensional operators. So if these uh, coefficients are order one, then not spoiling the solution to the strong CP problem sets an upper bound on the parity breaking scale of around 20 TeV, which is compatible with, with the lower bound from the direct production of, of W prime and C prime gauge bosons that as we discussed earlier uh, is currently around, around 18 TeV. So even another one breaking of parity by gravitational effects will not spoil these solutions to the strong CP problem. 
However, uh, these numbers are obviously very close to each other, which means that if gravity really maximally violates global symmetries, then the prediction for the neutron EDM uh, could certainly be large enough to be observed in, in upcoming measurements. What happens if parity was a gate symmetry? Uh, in this case, parity cannot be broken explicitly. Uh, they can only be broken spontaneously. The higher dimensional operators that we were just considering, those can still be there. Uh, they can still be generated, but their coefficients uh, would have to be Hermitian so as to respect generalized parity. And in that case, they would just not contribute to, to theta bar. But we still need to consider uh, higher dimensional operators that would break parity proportional to the scale of a spontaneous symmetry breaking. So for example, if we're, par if we're breaking parity uh, spontaneously with a, with a pseudo scalar, then there are two types of uh, dimension five higher dimensional operators. One is the obvious phi GG dual term. And a second one is sort of the standard Yukawa couplings, but multiply by, by one power of the, of the pseudo scalar. And again, uh, in this case in particular, when, when all the scalars get their revs, uh, these operators lead to a contribution to the quark mass matrix that in general will be complex um, and will generate a, a non-zero theta bar. So demanding that the contribution from these operators to theta bar is smaller than 10 to the minus 10 implies an upper bound on the parity breaking scale and the strongest bound actually comes from, from this second operator and is uh, of around 10 to the 7 GB. So this is a much weaker bound uh, than, than before when we were considering parity as a, as a global symmetry. Overall, uh, the message is that this class of solutions to the strong CP problem are very robust to, to the breaking of parity by, by higher dimensional operators. Okay, um, I am going to turn now to the last topic that I want to discuss. Um, this will probably take me around five minutes. Is it okay if I go over sort of five minutes? Yeah, Okay. sure. Okay, so um, I guess this is the last uh, thing that I want to talk about. So regardless of the exact details of how parity is spontaneously broken, um, a feature of any theory that contains spontaneously broken discrete symmetries is the presence of domain wall solutions. So these are topological defects, which are characterized by, by their surface tension, uh, which is set by the scale of a spontaneous symmetry breaking. And if the discrete symmetry is global, then these objects are topologically stable. Now, the existence of domain walls has traditionally been considered a fatal problem in, in theories with spontaneously broken discrete symmetries. And that's because this class of topological defects can be formed in the early universe after reheating takes place. If that happens, because the energy density in domain walls redshifts more slowly than matter or radiation, then the main walls end up dominating the universe's energy density. And this leads to a subsequent evolution that is incompatible with, with observation. However, this is no longer a problem if we remember that, again, we expect quantum gravity to violate all global symmetry. So the breaking of parity due to gravitational effects will break the degeneracy between the two vacua related by the, by the discrete symmetry. So for instance, this is the leading higher dimensional operator that breaks parity in the pseudo-scalar sector. And I am writing here an overall coefficient, uh, epsilon, that I'm using to parameterize how much gravity violates these, this global symmetry. So after a spontaneous symmetry breaking, this operator will lead to an energy difference between the two uh, previously degenerate vacua, which is parametrically is given by, by this expression, okay? So crucially, once uh, the two vacua are no longer degenerate, any domain wall network that may have formed in the early universe becomes unstable and Instead, the universe evolves into the vacuum that has the smallest energy density. 
When this happens, uh, however, the collapse of the domain wall network results in the emission of significant amounts of gravitational radiation that today we may be able to detect as a stochastic background of, of gravitational waves. So the evolution of the domain wall network and in particular the time it takes for the, for the network to collapse, that is determined by the competition of, of these two effects. So on the one hand, the fact that the two vacua at either side of the wall are no longer degenerate means that there is force per unit area on the on the wall due to this due to this pressure difference. So this obviously has a destabilizing effect on the network. And on the other hand, uh, the surface tension of the domain wall leads to a force per unit area again, which is now given by, by this expression, where R here, this refers to the typical radius of, of a domain wall. So typically um, the curvature radius of a domain wall uh, will typically be set by the Hubble scale at the time. Um, which during a radiation dominated universe is just proportional to, to T itself. So as time goes forward, the effect of this pressure difference becomes relatively more important and the whole network will collapse when, when these two quantities become comparable to each other. And this happens at a time that is precisely given by, by the ratio of the domain wall tension over the difference in, in energy density, which in turn, it is inversely proportional to, to the breaking of parity by say higher dimensional, higher dimensional operators. So obviously the smaller epsilon, uh, the smaller the breaking of parity by gravitational effects, the later the domain wall network will disappear. Uh, so there is a lower bound on how much parity has to be broken already in order to make sure that this time is fast enough um, and that the domain walls never come to dominate the, the total energy density. So this is what I'm showing here in this plot. So this y-axis corresponds to the coefficient of our parity violating higher dimensional operator. The x-axis corresponds to to the VEV of uh, the pseudo scalar, which you should think as just uh, V prime, the, the parity breaking scale. So values of the parity breaking scale below 18 TV, those again are ruled out by collider bounds uh, as we discussed earlier. On the other hand, values of V prime that are too large uh, to the right of this dashed line, um, here, the fine tuning in the scalar sector of the model becomes worse than one part in, in 10 to the 10. So ideally for low tuning, you want to live as close to this, to this green line as possible. And as I already said, uh, the leading lower bound on, on the size of epsilon comes from making sure that the domain walls disappear fast enough. And that rules out these, this, entire, this entire blue region. So, in the region of low tuning, uh, this coefficient needs to be, has to be larger than around 10 to the minus 13 or so. There are then two quantities that characterize the stochastic background of gravitational waves that results from the collapse of the domain walls, which are the peak frequency uh, of the background, as well as the strength of the signal at that frequency peak. So, the peak frequency is basically set by the typical radius of the domain walls at the time of collapse. Uh, parametrically, again, this is just given by uh, the corresponding Hubble scale, which during radiation dominated uh, universe just goes like, like T. On the other hand, uh, the amount of energy density that goes into gravitational radiation uh, that is essentially just determined by the, by the domain wall tension. So there is the mandatory power of U Newton, of course, and then uh, two powers of the of the domain wall tension uh, to make up for um, for dimensions. So the smaller epsilon, uh, the smaller the breaking of parity due to due to higher dimensional operators, the later the collapse of the network takes place, uh, and therefore the lower this frequency will be. But also because there is less redshift between the time of collapse and today. The stronger, uh, the stronger the signal we will get. So 
this is what I'm showing here in this plot. Uh, X axis is the peak frequency of the gravitational wave signal. Um, y axis is the energy density normalized to the critical energy density today as usual. And this is evaluated at, at the frequency peak of the, of the signal. So this entire blue region corresponds to the region where the peak of the stochastic background uh, in these models could fall. So this first dust line here uh, corresponds to a parity breaking scale of 18 TeV, which again is the minimum compatible with collider bounds. This other line here, uh, this is the value of the parity breaking scale where the fine tuning gets worse than one part in 10 to the 10. So again, for low tuning, you want to live as close to this, to this first dust line as possible. These thin dotted lines, this corresponds to fixed values of epsilon. So that was the coefficient of our parity breaking higher dimensional operator. So here going from 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 10 and so on. So there is some region of parameter space, uh, especially at low tuning where the signal from this stochastic background would be within reach of, of current and future gravitational wave detectors, in particular, the ones that are operating in, in this very low frequency range. So from 10 to the minus 10 to, to 10 to the minus six hertz. Okay, this is the very last slide I have before, before my conclusion. So obviously a full solution to, to this strong CP problem must also solve in particular, the electroweak hierarchy problem without spoiling a strong CP. This is true uh, not only for this class of models, but also for any other solution to the, to the strong CP problem, including the QCD axiom. It is true though, and this is one of the criticisms that was raised in this paper, that if one tries to supersymmetry this model, uh, the model that I discuss here, um, then this typically spoils the solution to the, to the strong CP problem. And this is a perfectly fair uh, criticism that again was, was raised in this paper. I wish I had something really smart to say about this. Uh, I don't. Um, I think building a, a UV completion to these models that stabilizes the parity breaking scale um, without spoiling a strong CP is, is certainly one of the most urgent uh, open questions in these, in these theories. So let me just conclude. Uh, theories that restore parity symmetry can provide an attractive solution to the, to the strong CP problem. And unlike other solutions like the QCD action in particular, they are robust against, against the breaking of global symmetries, especially as expected in the context of um, a gravitational UV completion. This class of solutions have experimental implications for a wide range of experiments, crucially colliders, but also others like EDM experiments or, or gravitational waves. And compared to other solutions to the strong CP problem, like uh, the QCD axiom again, I would say that these theories have been relatively underexplored and there are still many open questions. Again, especially uh, the, the question of UV completion, but it is also a timely opportunity given the progress that we are going to see in, in all of these experiments in the, in the relatively near future. So thank you. I'm sorry for, for going over time. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is there any questions? Let me turn on the lights actually, it's getting better. Um, I would have one question concerning the collider bounds on the W primes, which is uh, if you have W primes, if I understand correctly, those couplings are basic, uh, basically at tree level, right? Yeah. Do you get uh, constraints from electroweak precision and in particular from shifts of the Fermi constant? And are they stronger or weaker than the, electro uh, than the collider bounds? We did determine that the um, the leaving bounds actually came from 
the, the direct production uh, collider bounds, okay. uh, and I think this is just a consequence of the fact that this bound is already is already you know six. Pretty high, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, for sure. Uh, one uh, question concerning UV completions. You say supersymmetry mm. typically spo uh, spoils your symmetries. Are there any attempts to uh, try to UV complete in composite models? So I know there are some, um, so, you know, as you know, you know, and I did mention it briefly, you know, these models share a lot of features with Twin Peaks models, right? Mm -hmm. And there has certainly been, there's certainly, you know, been, there, there are UV completions of Twin Peaks models uh, in, into theories, in, into composite uh, theories. Um, but I do not know of any attempts of, you know, of implementing this, this specific type, right? So, you know, this is a theory where the SU3 factor is not mirror. Uh, you know, there is a certain relationship between the couplings that comes from this generalized you know, parity symmetry. So there are many shared features with the Twin Higgs models, but there are also some differences. Uh, and I, I to, to my knowledge, uh, no one has, I haven't seen a composite UV completion of this. Uh, it will be very interesting, I think, to, to see whether that improves or not uh, from the SUSI case, for instance. I agree. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I had a question about uh, uh, vector-like mass. Um, it seems the vector-like mass breaks by your number, so um, it would be uh, um, leading to a neutron anti-neutron oscillation. Which I mean, could okay, it breaks by your number. Um, one second. Yeah, so, you know, there is a C2 symmetry in particular in the, you know, in the mirror fermions that it, it is broken by the presence of these, of this spectral mm -hmm. mass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, from U going to U prime and then go back to U, mm -hmm. then, well, no, going to U and U, well, you yeah, have to you have to mix this operator with the you know the dimension for Yukawa uh, Yukawa terms as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You so, got actually involved. So uh, the answer is yes, um, yeah. mm -hmm. but it will involve. I think I think mm -hmm. the situation will be a little similar to what happens with the. Uh, well, I think without having thought about it in detail, actually, uh, I think what what will happen is a little similar to what happens here, where you will probably need, uh, you will probably find that you have two insertions of one over the heavy, the C yeah, scale yeah. vector like mass. And, you know, I've already told you like the parity mm -hmm. breaking scale is 18 TV and mm -hmm, vector, mm -hmm. the CISO scale needs to be parametrically mm -hmm. above V prime. So you can imagine the level of suppression that that's going to come with. Right. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, and, uh, well, another question is a, which is a bit uh, beyond your topic, but uh, because of the, the baryon number breaking, um, it will be affecting the generation of baryon asymmetry in the universe. Could, uh, have you ever thought of this implication? I, <laughs> um, I think the you know looking at the you know with this this is the mass spectrum, right? Of course, you know mm -hmm. the early universe when you are at temperatures much larger than I am, all of these particles are massless. Uh, I think it would be interesting to see how, you know, a model of biogenesis could be implemented in the... Yeah, that's sort of bound from, you know, generating baryon asymmetry because once baryon number is violated, uh, it will be washing out any asymmetry right. generated beforehand. So mm -hmm. uh, that will give a bound on this uh, mass scale. Okay. Uh, that would be interesting. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, oh, any I other questions? So I, I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much for a nice talk. Okay. And uh, in, in the middle of your talk, you uh, briefly discussed this uh, twin Higgs model mm -hmm. where uh, SU, global SU4 is broken to SU3. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any uh, known UV completions where this 
kind of a uh, global symmetry breaking can be realized? There are UV completions uh, of mm. there, are, there are UV completions of uh, of these twin Higgs models, uh, both in the context of of supersymmetry and also uh, in the context of of composite Higgs. Um, I mean, I, yeah. For example, like the the supersymmetry, um, you know, the twin Suisi UV completion. There is a well-known paper by uh, one of my collaborators here, actually Nathaniel Craig and Kyle Howe. Mm -hmm. uh, and I I forget who the authors of the of the composite models are, but they are mm. also I believe they are cited on that paper. Mm. And another question is uh, you in the uh, you discussed the case where. Uh, parity is broken, but CP is not broken. Mm -hmm. uh, but the uh, the theta bar parameter or uh, electron neutron EDM, they actually break parity and the uh, uh, time reverse asymmetry, uh, right? Yes. So I, I wonder in that example of uh, uh, parity is broken, but CP is not broken. So how large is the contribution to the uh, electron neutron EDM? Yeah, so in that case, like, you know, if, if parity uh, was broken without breaking CP, then mm. the contribution to, to theta bar would be no larger than it is in the standard model. So you are not introducing okay. any new CP violating phases. And mm. moreover, um, you know, above the parity breaking scale, the, the theory is fully parity symmetric. So there is some cancellation coming from that. Mm. So no larger than in the standard model. So effectively, you know, way, thank way you. below current bounds. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So do you have any comments on the left on flavor violation? Do, you, do I have any comments on lepton flavor violation? Uh, yeah, yeah. Not really. So, uh, you know, as I told you here, I was giving you here this example uh, involving, you know, BMS on the K to two muons. Uh, you know, this, this structure, I was telling you uh, that this, this vertex is suppressed by uh, here the powers of the, of the, the masses of the fermions that are involved in this, in this flavor changing interaction. Uh, the same is true in the lepton sector. So you can imagine if I'm looking to something like mu to three e, here I would have you know mu mass times electron mass, so it would be even smaller than this. So yes, there is there is three levels f and c's in the lepton sector. They're, they're just super tiny. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Oh, I, I want to ask uh, the about the U-on part. Yes. You said the middle part of U-on is not needed. Could you explain yes. a little bit more about it? Mm -hmm. So, um, so in principle, you know, when I when I tell you how this model solves the strong CP problem, in principle, it doesn't matter whether you get to the U-1 or not. Um, However, if I imagine, you know, I decided to gauge the, the U1 prime, that would forbid, that would stop me from being able to write those vector-like masses that allow me to realize the seesaw mechanism. That would force me to live uh, in a situation where this is uh, the spectrum of, of mirror fermions. Uh, therefore, I would be in a situation where the parity breaking scale would have to be above this scale, above 10 to the AGB. And therefore uh, the scalar sector of my model would be tuned to the level of, you know, worse than one part in 10 to the 10. What I win by not gauging the U1 prime factor is that I can now write, now it is, you know, it is, I can, I can write these new, uh, these new operators consistent with gauge invariance. This allows me to realize uh, this CISO limit that allows me to make all of these you know, colored uh, new fermions heavy by raising the CISO scale, not the parity breaking scale. And this is how we improve uh, on the fine tuning in particular about seven orders of magnitude. 
So it's not that you cannot do it. Uh, it's just you know the level of fine tuning in the in the model. If you if you were to gauge that you want that extra U1 factor would put you in a situation where that's already worse than the one you know ten to the minus ten number that you are trying to explain when you when you try to solve the small CP problem. So it's more a structural reason rather. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's uh, thank to Isabel. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Isabel, please. Okay.